Okay. Hi, my name is Esther Choi. I'm a research fellow at the Sustainable Finance Initiative. And the first part of my presentation will be about the overview of SFI. And this is on behalf of Alicia Seeger, the managing director of SFI. Uh, she could not be here because she's in DC testifying before Congress about the macroeconomic impacts of climate change, which is very cool. Um, but she sends her regards. And if you have any questions about SFI or any opportunities for collaboration, please feel free to reach out to her directly. She's a great person to talk to. Okay. And this is the contents of the overview. Um, and I'll start with the mission of SFI. SFI aims to scale up and accelerate the flow of capital toward the decarbonization of global systems by developing and deploying innovative policies and financial mechanisms, educating leaders, and engaging with the global policy and finance community. Um, SFI believes that climate solutions have moved away from high altitudes to grounded situated solutions. So we work in close collaboration with key governments and uh, private actors in countries like China, India, and the United States to advance and transform ideas into impactful action um, that is context specific. Um, building on Stanford's capacity to generate and apply knowledge, SFI's mission is to design and deploy economic and financial solutions that can serve to unlock capital at the speed and scale required to transition into a decarbonized and climate resilient global economy. And we have identified four structural barriers to that hinder effective flow of climate finance. The first is that public spending has yet to catalyze private investment at the requisite speed and scale. The second is climate risk is not properly measured, disclosed, or managed. Um, stranded assets are not dealt fast and effectively, and that systems must be fundamentally and massively transformed. And based on these four structural barriers, we have identified four focal areas for SFI's work. Um, under catalyzing private capital, the specific areas of investigation include um, blended finance, which is the use of um, public and philanthropic capital to mobilize additional private capital. And that I will talk about um, more in more details after this presentation. We have the we assess the effectiveness of green bonds. Um, uh, purpose built pu public and private equity vehicles and business innovation. For risk metrics and management, SFI um, explores the frontier of this area, including the application of big data analytics and artificial intelligence on the computation of physical and transition risks. For stranded assets, SFI develops and tests the use of stabilization funds, securitization, and green bonds as a means to help governments manage the liabilities of stranded fossil generation assets. And SFI believes that the solutions are, climate solutions are tied to systemic innovation than, rather than just one-off projects. That's why um, SFI explores the risking new energy and infrastructure solutions that would require systems thinking and anal analysis to identify the most promising opportunities. And Girish can talk more about this particular work stream. And examples include market design and energy reform in India and system integration at the regional levels in China and Southeast Asia. SFI's operating model is a team of teams. Um, SFI's core team comprised of its directors, fellows like myself, and advisors will select projects, provide resources, and ensure that the operation of individual projects are aligned with the global context and the principles of SFI. And these are the people affiliated with SFI, with Tom Heller as faculty director and Alicia Seeger as managing director. We have fellows, uh, research fellows, project leads, energy scholars, uh, visiting scholars, and a program manager. And as you can see from here, we have uh, the, our advisory board consists of renowned experts in various fields associated with um, SFI, SFI's work streams. Our products include a deep engagement with governments, NGOs, investors, and other academics. We, of course, publish papers, and they're available on the SFI website. 
We design and host student seminars and stakeholder engagement workshops. We conduct outreach to Stanford faculty to build greater network and capacity. And above all, we strive to address the challenge, daunting challenges ahead of us that is climate change. And if you have any more questions, there's more details and other information on the website um, URLs here. And we look forward to engaging with many of you and collaborating um, in the near future. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about the stuff that I'm actually responsible for at SFI, which is a blended finance. So as you can see, Remember from this chart below, a blended finance belongs to the catal catalyzing private capital work streams. And this blended finance is a relatively new area of investigation for SFI. And we are currently writing a scoping paper to be published by the um, APAC Investor Forum in Chile um, this November, upcoming November. Um, and as an intro, um, so this presentation will be about, uh, the main purpose is to introduce you to the world of blended finance um, and to talk briefly about what the paper is about. And before I go into what blended finance is, I wanted to highlight this urgency of for our action because we tend to forget the, about this, lose sight of this, this urgency um, because we hear, tend to hear about the, sa the, the same message over and over again and the impacts of climate change are often diffused across time and space. So just to illustrate what type of actions and the financing needs, um, we have, so in order to keep warming within of 1.5 Celsius, we uh, need, the CO2 emissions need to decline by about 45% by 2030, reaching net zero by 2050. And this means for energy systems, renewables are projected to supply about 85% of electricity in 2050, and the use of coal would be zero. And industries will need to reduce emissions by almost 90% lower in 2050 relative to 2010. And that translates into uh, trillions of investment needs in energy systems. And that will require a major shift in investment patterns. And we all know that public budget is highly constrained and the use of philanthropy is limited. Um, and we also need to consider the nature of infrastructure and built environment and the carbon lock-in effect that they bring about. Because once they are built, it's very hard to shift their emissions trajectory or the way of doing things. It's very expensive, very difficult. So it is critical to get, get it right at the design phase. And this type of investment opportunities are more uh, available in emerging and developing countries. Developing countries may not have done so much to cause climate change, but today they are half of the 20 biggest emitters. Um, since 2000, emerging economies in Asia uh, are driving the growth in emissions, and the top four emitters, uh, which are China, US, the European Union, and India, contribute to the majority of um, total uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the last decade. So even if developed countries stopped all emissions uh, by 2050, warming would still exceed two degrees by the end of the century without developing countries on board. And this is particularly critical given the potential of them leapfrogging to the more energy efficient and low carbon systems and the significance of carbon locking caused by infrastructure and policy choices that I just talked about. So that being said, <laughs> blended finance, there's no uh, common uh, universal definition for blended finance, but it generally it is known as the strategic use of public and philanthropic funds to mobilize additional capital and commercial ca um, cap private and co commercial capital in support of low carbon investments. So the aim is to increase the available financing for climate mitigation by mobilizing additional funding that does not have a climate mandate, which is often the case for private and commercial capital. 
Um, the logic behind blend finance is pretty simple. Investors and project developers respond to the risk return profile of associated with investments. And they're usually hesitant to invest in developing countries because of the perceived and real risks, such as uh, various market failures and information asymmetry. So public support through the various blended finance vehicles can improve this re risk return profile um, in developing countries. Um, for example, institutional investors such as insurance and pension funds, they in the OECD alone have $92 trillion in assets, but they only invest only 1% in infrastructure. So there is a clear mismatch between supply and demand, and blended finance has the potential to bridge these two. There's a range of approaches available. One is financial instruments such as equity, loans, mezzanine, and guarantees and grants. And the other one is a structuring mechanism uh, such as funds, syndication, securitization, and public-private partnership. And another characteristic of blended finance is that is a, it is a means to an act. The goal is to facilitate market building so that the private, um, a lo a private standalone investment it can sustain itself after this concessional capital exits. So it is temporary in nature. So against this backdrop, the scoping paper explores these four questions. What are the specific demands for decarbonization? Where are they located? What is the role of blended finance in meeting these needs? And what has been the additionality, scalability, and impact of major blended finance vehicles so far? And what are we missing to advance the research and practice forward? So the purpose of this paper is to raise issues and questions that can help frame a research agenda and chart the right course and set the right expectations for blended finance. So we have known for a while that it is important to engage and catalyze the private capital um, for public goods, but the implementation aspect has been largely a blank. So that's why this paper, uh, and it, this paper consists of a series of case studies, and each case study describes how blending has been applied um, focusing on the location in terms of financing, the financing structures, and the project's contribution to decarbonization. I look, we look at sources and intermediaries, uh, financial instruments used, who the recipient, actual recipients are, um, what kind of activities are funded, and what kind of impact were achieved if the data is available. And these are the cases that we are currently exploring. The, Five, four or five cases. The GIRAP is managed by European Investment Bank. It's been there for a while, and they're, they're proposing a next um, phase for this particular vehicle. CP, CP3 is uh, run by the UK government, and I believe this is the biggest equity fund um, run by a, a good national government. Climate Finance Partnership is was announced last year as a flagship blended finance vehicle with BlackRock, the biggest asset manager, as one of the partners. Climate Investor One is um, a one-stop shop for renewable energy um, projects that manages from developing pipeline projects to construction and implementation. And New Forest Initiative is unique because most vehicles are focused on renewables and clean energy, and this one is particularly focused on the forestry sector. So yeah, I'm, uh, we are in the process of talking to the project managers and major stakeholders uh, related to these cases. Yeah, so if you have any questions about this particular paper or the field of blended finance, please feel free to reach out to me and ask any questions. I would love to talk to uh, many of you about this. Thank you. And now I turn to Girish. Hi everyone, um, it's good to see you and I think uh, there's a good mix of people here. Um, I'm going to mostly talk about my work at SFI but uh, I kind of wanted to stress on a couple of broader things first. Um, one is uh, what we work on is 
problems that are relevant to key stakeholders, so that's important. Uh, so typically we try to find a client, uh, and typically the client is either a policymaker in a country or it's a, um, you know, a large public sector entity. And the idea is that you're, you're working on practical problems. So even though we want to apply analytical rigor and, and kind of in-depth analysis to problems, which is what we do at universities, we want those problems to be practical and we want the solutions to be actually used by the stakeholders. So that's, that's a very, very key aspect. Um, the other thing that's unique about SFI, and uh, um, I, I'm happy, or we are happy to take uh, this in uh, questions also as to how, how do you work with SFI, right? Um, because it's, it's, it's kind of unique or in the sense that um, you may not have seen any students assigned here in the people that uh, Esther put up. Um, and the idea is that we do work with students. Um, but again, it has to be connected to these practical problems that we have identified over time. Uh, we work with faculty uh, supervisors with, uh, who bring in students into the projects. And, and overall, uh, students do end up working on, on our projects. So we can talk more about how that can be made to happen. Okay. Um, but having said that, um, let me just talk a little bit about my specific work. And I'll also kind of connect uh, towards the end of what, what I discuss. Uh, is some projects that I'm thinking about that connect to broader uh, SFI areas, okay? Um, so first, let me start with what, what have I worked on in the last year or so. Um, and this is this area of energy system transition, which is the fourth area that Esther talked about. And this also does connect to this third area of stranded assets, okay? Um, and I have mostly worked on India. Um, but a lot of this stuff that we work on could be broadly applicable to other countries. Uh, as Esther said, we focus on China, US, and India, so that's where the focus is, but doesn't mean that the, we stay limited to those areas. Um, so that's, that's something else to keep in mind. Um, and, and what you'll also realize is that as I talk about my work, um, it is going to sound similar to traditional energy policy. Okay, so even though we have sustainable finance initiative in our name, we do work at the intersection of policy, finance, and business, right? Which means you are connected to policy making. And if it's not clear, I want to stress that, that it is about policy making to a large extent. And so it kind of overlaps with a lot of stuff that uh, many of uh, the faculty do at Stanford and many of the, uh, you might be interested in, okay? Uh, so th with that groundwork, um, the idea is that you're applying uh, finance and economic principles um, and, 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 and using those principles to make, hopefully, recommendations that policymakers and uh, decision makers could use. Uh, so let me now jump into uh, three specific projects and with the context. So the context is, as I said, about India. Um, and uh, India, like, many other countries is going through massive energy system transition, okay? And that you could apply it to any country of your choice, but a lot of countries are going through this transition. Um, India has, uh, uh, and, and, and a lot of that is part of the nationally determined contribution that we announced in Paris, right? Um, and India's uh, NDC is uh, about, we would say, uh, 350 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2030, right? That was kind of a number that was announced. Or uh, another a number that's thrown out is uh, about 30% reduction in energy intensity um, uh, compared to 2005, right? So that's the context. And, and the idea is how do you get there? Um, so uh, as, as, as we look at it, as, as we decarbonize electricity, for example, um, we will have increasing penetration of renewables in the system, right? And as we have increasing penetration of renewables in the system, what does that do? And what is the characteristic of renewables is that they're variable. They're not producing at all times. Uh, they're intermittent. Uh, solar could actually, you know, the sun could go behind clouds any, at any point in time, right? So they're intermittent. So we have to start thinking about what we call flexibility services that provide flexibility into the system, right? And, and these flexibility services, and if you come from the energy area, you know about a lot of them. 
Um, they're called regulation services. They're called ramping. Uh, there's a lot of energy arbitrage during the day when you're storing energy somewhere, when there's solar and wind generating energy, and then putting it back in the system. And the question that I'm working on, just as a high-level thing, is um, how do you enable through policy, how do you enable through policy low-cost availability of these technologies? Okay? That's as simple as that. Because what you want is, as the system is transforming, are we doing our job as policymakers and the society to enable low-cost availability of those technologies so that when we are ready to absorb them into the system, you know, they're competitive in the marketplace because that's important, right? And that you've seen happen with solar and wind, right? There were a lot of policy mechanisms that were used to bring solar and wind into the system. So you want to do the same thing with uh, energy storage. You want to do the same thing with demand response, okay? Um, and so that's the project that we have just started. Um, and I'm, I'm going to throw out some technical terms here. And many of you who know energy might know this already. When you, when you want to do this low-cost availability of technologies, you have to do it from two angles. One is what we call the push side, which is the supply side of things. So how do you design policies on the R&D side? How do you design policies on the manufacturing side um, to enable this low-cost production or the supply side of things? right? But on the other hand, you have to also design policies on the demand side or the pull side, uh, similar to procurement that you do in many states, et cetera. So how do you design those policies? And what can you learn from the best practices, et cetera? So that's one project, OK? And I'm going to stay at this level for now, but just to give you a flavor. Um, one other thing I want to talk about, my own work, to give you a sense of what we do, uh, and that's connected to, again, energy system transition, is very interesting questions come up. And two of the questions are, one is, as the solar and wind deployment is increasing around the world, and take any country, take US, take China, take India, take Chile, take Mexico, uh, you will see very low um, auction prices for solar. Right? You've seen those. I mean, you know, you're seeing prices of two cents per kilowatt hour. right? So what that tells you is that solar and wind now, today, at an average cost basis, average cost, which means lifetime average cost, right, basis, is cheaper than variable cost of coal. And that's important. It's variable cost of coal. It's not average cost of coal. So you can forget about the fixed cost and the capital costs or capital investments that have gone into coal, coal plants, right? Average cost of solar is cheaper than variable cost of coal. What that means is, you know, that's basically economics 101, right? It's, it's a sound economic decision today, right, that I start buying power from solar as opposed to coal. And just to kind of nuance that, it's not just solar versus coal. It's new solar versus existing coal. That's, that's big, right? Because so far the discussion has been, oh, can we do solar versus coal or solar versus gas? And it was all about new versus new. But here I'm saying, what I'm saying is that's the nuance that you need to think about is it's new solar. I can actually deploy new solar and retire existing coal. OK? And then the whole, you open a Pandora's box here saying, OK, I want to do that because I'm an economist. And you know, I learned this cool thing. I'm going to apply this, right? And that's where it gets into real decision making. And, and what Esther had talked about, it's about just transitions, right? You're going to deal with lobbies. You're going to deal with our president in the US, right? Because it's about the jobs of the coal workers, right? So how do you make sure that you're prescribing a solution? You're prescribing a solution where you're clearly showing the value being created in the process. You're creating value. Value means dollar amounts. You're going to save money. And I've already shown that example of variable cost being uh, kind of the average cost being lower than variable cost. So you're saving money right there, right? But I can also figure out other ways to save money. And I'm not going to go into details. But then once that money that's being saved, could I use that money in a way to do just transitions? And just transition means that you're creating a mechanism to transfer money across different stakeholder groups that 
you end up creating a win-win situation and create a solution that's politically feasible. Okay, so that's 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 an example of creating win-win situations using finance, where you actually first figure out the value, and then you figure out ways through economic principles to how do you make the solutions equitable. Right? You must have heard this term called equity. So so that's the second example. Um, and a third uh, uh, project that I worked on last year was uh, this whole question of mini grids. So that's also part of energy system transition. In many countries, and, and India as, a, as another example, now we, have, um, we are really focused on energy access because that's a sustainable development goal, right? So how do you create business models and financing mechanisms to make sure that uh, you are again creating value that is Again, um, creating win-win situations. And I can answer detailed questions on that, but that was another project that I worked on, OK? Um, now I'll just kind of stop there on my work. And I want to give you a few other teasers on potential projects right? that we are thinking about that potentially where students can connect on. And obviously, there are a lot more projects beyond what Esther talked about and what I am talking about. Um, so one of the projects is, and, and this is just giving more color to our bullet points, right? One of the pro uh, projects could be, and if you're interested in finance, uh, you're coming from portfolio optimization or from banking industry or investment industry, and that question is, you know, we talked about these trillions of investments needed, right? You have heard these numbers, uh, 1 to 4 or 1.6 to 3.5 trillion a year. We need that investment in clean infrastructure and clean energy. Uh, but how do we convince the investors to invest? Right? Because when you go to investors, by the way, this is the flip side of the coin, because we make a lot of noise saying, hey, uh, we need this money. You guys are not investing. And you go to investors, and the investors say, you know what? Give us good projects. Yeah. You know? Give us a way to invest. Show us there's value in investing in these projects. And again, I'm using this term value kind of in a loose way. But how do you show value? So the idea where, where I'm going with this is that you again need to show the investors through your research, our research, that there is value in investing in these projects. These projects means clean energy, green infrastructure, electric vehicles, whatever your pet thing is, right? And let me dig a little bit deeper, because it, it's getting towards a question that you could answer as your master's thesis or a PhD thesis, right? The question is, if I could create an asset class, which is essentially renewable energy assets, can you show that that asset class in a portfolio optimization problem add value in the terms of, is it reducing risk in a portfolio? Is it increasing returns in a portfolio? You know, so that's and that's this is the kind of work we're trying to do, right? Um, my, I will say one more thing, and and then I'll stop. And I don't know how we are doing on time. Yeah, um, yeah. So this is related to what Esther had mentioned at mentioned as climate risk as connecting to financial risk. OK? Because climate risk um, comes in two forms, and actually it comes in three forms. One is called the physical risk that you guys all know about, right? Physical risk is what? Anybody? What is the physical risk? Uh, we've been talking, so I think I'll <laughs> convert this into a class. What's the physical risk? Fires, high temperatures. Fires, high temperatures, floods, cyclones, right? So that's physical risk. And so one is this physical risk, and if the physical risks are increasing, then you can connect it to financial numbers, right? If I'm an investor with a real estate portfolio that I'm holding on to a bunch of properties in Florida, right? can you identify how that risk is increasing in a two-degree scenario, in a four-degree scenario? Because that has implications for financial decision making, right? So that's an example of a question that people are working on, students could work on, right? How do you identify 
the implication of a scenario or different scenarios on, on the financial assets, okay? So that's a physical risk side. But there are other risks that are coming up. And one of the risks that you will hear being talked about is called transition risk. Anybody knows about transition risk? What's a transition risk? Maybe in 10 years, there is a new form of energy that may complete my solar panel. Exactly, exactly. So tra the transition risk is what businesses care about, right? So you, as a business, operate in an environment which has multiple parameters, right? There's policy and regulation, the markets, the technologies, which was your example, they're all changing, right? And because climate change is such a dynamic problem, are businesses today accounting for the potential transition risks in terms of policy changes, market changes, technology changes? Are they accounting for it? And the answer is, to a large extent, no. Because the issue is they don't even know what the transition scenarios are, what is the likely impact of those scenarios on their valuations, company valuations, and fundamentally, they don't even know what are the probabilities of these transitions. Like, for example, at least in the physical risk side, I can do some modeling using AI and machine learning, right? Transition risk is a much harder problem. But where I want to stop is that what we are starting to think in our group, and we are trying to kind of catalyze this throughout Stanford is, and this is very, very, you know, I've been talking mostly about economics and finance and, and talking about economic terms and financing terms. But this is one of the big open problem today, which is how do I use AI and machine learning techniques to model climate risk? You know, this thing I just talked about, how do I model the probability of these transitions, right? It's, it's a real dynamic problem that you have to predict, right? So I think this, with that, I mean, I think I've run through multiple examples of what I do, what our center does. Hopefully it gives you a sense. And uh, as, as Esther had said that, uh, please feel free to reach out to any of us. Uh, please do CC, um, um, Alicia on that, because Alicia is our main interface, but uh, we hope to work with uh, many of you going forward. So again, welcome. Yes, happy to take questions. Hi, my name is Eric, and uh, I'm an MSNE. Um, so it seems uh, almost common sense that all these investors who have maybe holdings in like utility stock know that there's a lot of risk, you know, with climate risk and fire. Um, are they waiting for sort of models and results to come out to help guide them, you know, away from these investments and towards sort of safer and less um, climate risky investments? And they're waiting for studies like these that you guys are spearheading to come out, or are you approaching them, or is it, is it two-sided? Yeah, so should I go first? Uh, so I think it, it's not, I, if I implied that, it's not correct. I think, um, I think investors are aware of these issues. Um, it's just that some of this decision-making is, is easier for them. For example, if you see the valuation of coal companies or coal plants, um, that has gone down because that's an obvious thing. But some of the things are not that straightforward, not that easy, like this whole issue of transition risk, right? Um, so it's, it's, it, it's, it's an answer which basically is all of the above. It's, uh, people are at different places on that spectrum. And, and that's why it creates an opportunity for us to create evidence so that they can you know, incorporate that evidence in their decision making. Um, just to be, um, you know, just to give more color to that, um, equity investors are starting to think about um, transition risk and, and how would that transition risk impact 
uh, their por portfolio optimization problem. So it's just starting, right? Um, on the debt side, uh, central banks are starting to think about this, and they're trying to tell, um, and they're going to talk about uh, in an open forum saying, look, we need to worry about this transition risk issue and, and, and figuring out how perhaps uh, make that part of uh, this whole thing they call Basel, Basel protocol for, for uh, bank regulation, right? So, so it's all very, very active, okay? So. And just to add on, that, that question also highlights the importance of what we call intermedi intermediaries, um, who, who actually, whose role is to bring together the investors, the financiers, the, development, like the project developers, basically everyone to form, in my case, blended finance vehicle. And usually the intermediaries are the role that role is played by MDBs because multilateral development banks they because they speak the language of both uh, financiers and um, development or public goods. So, so increasingly the role of intermediaries is increasing in this this fi uh, climate finance arena because there is a mismatch between supply and demand and there has to be a someone playing the role bridging them together. So. Thanks. Um, I have two questions. The first one should be uh, simple, and the second one a bit more complicated. Um, the first one is: um, Are you guys looking at the cost of renewables in the in a future scenario where penetration is high um, in, in a country, for instance, um, because we have to get to zero by 2050? But I would imagine that the cost of renewables becomes exorbitantly expensive without the right storage technologies, etc. Is that something that SFI is looking at? And uh, the other second question? And the second question is, um, in terms of the final uh, point that you made around um, uh, pricing the risk um, of, 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 uh, of climate change, I was wondering if this is going to inform, if the, if the goal here was to inform portfolios so that they de devalue their assets based on climate change, and as such, um, by, by some rate, and if they do invest in, in renewables, then that, that, that factor, um, that destruction of value can be reduced. Is, is that how that mechanism would, would inform investors? Yeah, so the first question is yes. I mean, you do, and I think uh, that, that's uh, kind of a reasonably well-known fact that as you have more renewables going into the system, um, the system level cost of dealing with availability and intermittency is gonna go up. Right, and that's what I was alluding to in the beginning. So you have to do cost minimization at a system level. So that's part of what we look at. It ha you have to, right? Because at the end of the day, as economists, we are trying to minimize system costs, right? So that, that, that's, that's number one. The number two is this whole question about as the, as the models improve and as investors get better understanding of these different scenarios and the probabilities of those scenarios, would they rebalance their portfolios? And that's exactly what I was going to, I was trying to say it through my speech, but that's, that's exactly what it is, that you will end up, and the, the idea is that they will end up rebalancing their portfolio, right? And, 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 and again, to rebalance the portfolio, it connects to another thing I had said. They have to have indices that you create that you can allocate some of your money to. And so, so it all goes together, right? So hopefully I've answered both the questions. Yeah, you want to? Thank you for that. Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay, actually the question now, she has the question again. So we'll go there and, yeah. Right. Yes, um, so a lot of the risk you're talking about may not be like the physical risk and transition risk. Seems like it'll happen not necessarily in the next year or two, but in like 10 years plus. So how do you, how are you working with Investors to understand, like their more sh to overcome their more short-term perspective, and they need to have like quarterly returns or annual returns to make their investors happy um, versus that longer-term risk, which like is a wiser decision in the long run. I Do you want to take that? Sure. I don't think the risk is long-term. It's already there, and it's already in. Um, in it's been incorporated into their. Um, assessments, ex ante assessment before they invest in any type of projects. So, and in terms, and 
Inve uh, infrastructure projects tend to have a very long, long-term period for from the construction to implementation, and that's why institutional investors who have longer um, period of looking at things are perfect um, type of investors to bring into the, to the table for this type of infrastructure projects. But for other types of investors, um, do you, do you want yeah, to yeah. So I think you bring up a very valid point, and I, I want to make sure that everybody is aware of that. Because when we talk about climate risks, and Esther is right that we are starting to see the impacts now, but in terms of material impact on valuation of on properties or or investments or asset classes, um, you know, physical risk is and uh, transition risk are what we call a 10 to 30 year problems. So mm -hmm. as you go out more in time, you see more of an impact. Whereas most of the decision makers, whether it's policy makers or is investors, they operate in less than a five year time horizon, if so, mm -hmm. right? Um, they're operating sometimes in a two year time horizon. So how do you align the two is, is a hard problem. And, and we don't have a solution for that yet, by the way. And, and that creates work for all of us. Um, but having said that, I want to connect to Esther's point about you have to start working with actors where it matters now. right? And institutional investors, it matters now. right? Because they invest long term. So they need to know what's happening on their assets. Um, Insurance companies need to know now, right? So I think the idea is to start working with stakeholders who start caring, who will have enough of a weight, and then you start creating this momentum that becomes more mainstream. So if you're from the marketing side of things, right, it's the early stages of the diffusion process, so you have to go to the early adopters, kind of, in some sense. Um, but by the way, central banks, and this is something that if Tom Heller, our, our, our faculty head, if he would be here, he would talk about this a lot. Central banks are under a lot of risk. And central banks are these, you know, the Fed, the US Fed, right? They are under a lot of risk because countries as a whole are under a lot of risk. Countries, actually, by the way, if you don't know, countries hold a lot of these fossil fuel assets on their balance sheet. And we are trying to do analysis which shows how much is this value at risk on the country's balance sheet. There was this one study that was just done on South Africa. And it shows that a lot of the assets that South Africa, as a government, South African bank, hold on their books are at risk because of climate transition. So, so all this is starting to happen. It's a very active field. So I'll stop there, right? But it's a hard problem. Yes. Hi. Uh, so increasingly more investors are interested in ESG. Yes. However, uh, data available for publicly traded companies is quite limited yet. So what are your thoughts on policies to push for uh, more transparency and standardization of data? And, and it's, we are part of this whole initiative, but you know, this task force for financial disclosure, is, especially in the investors community, it's, it's there. So I think a lot of these initiatives are there, and a lot of these initiatives we are part of. But the whole idea is you're right, that to even evaluate risk or to kind of communicate that risk to a particular stakeholder, we need to have data. And so data, that data is starting to, you know, being collected and kind of being made public. So that's also, it's a work in progress and it's also a very active area of research. How do you even figure out, uh, uh, you know, and uh, one of our colleagues, So Young, who is not here, is working on how do you get objective measurements of environmental social governance metrics at a company level mm. so that you can actually make decisions. Because right now, a lot of these ESG metrics are self-reported, so they can be gamed, right? So, so how do you do that? So anyways, so there's a lot of, lot of interesting stuff happening, yeah. But every question you're asking is like making me think of a lot of interesting questions that you could yourself answer, right? So that's, that's a good thing. Uh, it's a new area. But I guess that was the last question, right? Yes, you're welcome to stick around for the I'm, break. Uh, we, we, are, will... we can stick around. Uh, uh, happy to answer questions one-on-one. -on -one, but thank you uh, for coming here. And uh, 
I wish you luck. It's a great place. I think the real challenge at Stanford is how do you sit in classrooms when the weather is so great outside and you could be hiking all the time, right? <laughs> But it's, it's a wonderful place to be, so welcome. And I did my PhD from here, so uh, I have a really hard time getting out of this place after 20 years. So that, that attests to that. Thank Girish, you. Girish and Esther, thank you so much. We will go to break now and be back at 10, 10 o'clock.